We're moving into effective lengths now to look at how to design a beam and to go through breaking it up into different sections because this is another place that I find people often struggle when it comes to design of steel structures. Because here we're going to go through an example quickly of a beam and many people then design this as one entity. But when it comes to um, flexure design, bending design, we need to break it up between points of lateral support. So we need to take the single beam, it's fixed on the one side, got a support, and we've got lateral supports, lateral supports, and then no lateral supports. We've got to um, break this up into three different sections and design it as a L1, L2 and L3, we've got three specific lengths to design and we're going to have three sets of calculations to check the resistance. Now, as an engineer in practice, you wouldn't want to go through three when you can go through one. So often with most beams, you can just identify which section is most critical because it's the longest and it has the highest load and then just design that section. Sometimes you may have to design two or three because you're not actually sure which section governs, but you would normally just try to reduce your amount of work. But we're going to have a look at all three sections then and then go through it. But firstly, just to remember, in terms of lengths and designs, we have lateral supports there and then a fixed support. These lateral supp supports have no influence on analysis. You actually ignore these lateral supports totally when it comes to analysis. So we'll take our beam, we'll fix it, a bottom support, and we've got our two loads. When it comes to the analysis, the loads push down, the beam will deflect and bend, but these will just move with the beam. They could be a small beam coming in from the side, it could be a floor, it could be a brace or a bracket or a piece of concrete, it could be almost anything. It is preventing buckling sideways. It has no influence on the bending moment diagram. It has no influence on the compression load if there is compression. So we forget about them. We apply our loads. We get our analysis. We get our bending moments done. Then we come to the design phase where these become critical. These lateral supports prevent buckling and so we design from support to support because if we have a look at the section, I'm just going to draw a plan view here and just think how this would buckle because it is fixed securely into the side here. So it cannot rotate in plan. So if I put a vertical axis through the beam here, a vertical axis going right down there. So this is a plan view. This is the side view. It cannot rotate there. So the beam will come straight out. It's kind of like a column with a fixed support. It cannot rotate. It is straight. It will not uh, rotate there. But when we come to this support here, this, these lateral supports prevent sideways movement, but the beam can twist there. It can experience a, a twist about a vertical axis. So here you could have some amount of twist. So the first section would be kind of fixed on the one side and then pinned on the other. So this is a beam. We're looking at the compression flange and the compression flange could be either one. In this case, it's actually the bottom flange, but it will buckle. Can't rotate, can rotate. Now we continue on. We get to here. And here, yes, similar story. It can rotate, so this would go all the way down around and up. So this is our sort of buckled shape. And once again, we would look at our compression flange with this one, and then the, that can buckle. And then we come through to our cantilever. Nothing is preventing this from um, buckling. So what happens is this whole section can move sideways. So this can just go on. So then you can just have it buckling out. So if this is the sort of axis of our beam, the whole section can just kind of flop away. As we load, eventually gets a stage where the whole beam kicks one way or the other and folds out the way. And then here it, it cannot move sideways there and it cannot move sideways there. Buckles up and down, cannot rotate. And so it kind of looks like fixed pinned, 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 and then pinned free if you were thinking of it as a column. So now let's come to the, the design of it. Firstly, we've got our three lengths. We've got our L1, L2, L3. And then the important thing is to uh, look at firstly, is this a normal load or a destabilizing load in the design? Because it influences our uh, effective length. This specific topic is covered elsewhere with the videos. But firstly, now we're coming to normal versus destabilizing. Here's our first section. There's only one load, P2. And remember the two criteria for a destabilizing load, it's applied to the top flange and the top flange can move sideways along with the load. Here, load is on the top flange, yes, but no, it cannot move sideways. So when it comes to the load, this is a normal load here. 
moving on to the next section. There is no loads applied here. Same thing, P2 is applied at a point of lateral support. It cannot buckle sideways. So once again, L2 is a normal, normal load. And then section, here we have load on top flange and the load and the section can move sideways because let's say that is where the load would end up. So as we load it, it eventually gets to the stage it buckles, the load and it all, all kick out. So here we have a destabilizing load. We have satisfied the two criteria of a cantilever being uh, a destabilizing load. It's on the top flange and it can move. So then just watch type, because now we also need to see which table are we looking up our effective length factors in. And we've got two tables, simply supported cantilever. This is simply supported table we're looking in. This one's also simply supported. And this last one is a cantilever the cantilever table. And then now it comes to our effective length for design. And this is where the boundary conditions influence the resistance. So here, an axis running vertically, up and down, it is preventing rotation. It is not preventing rotation here. So here we've got practically fixed. practically fixed when it comes to looking up our values so right there and there that's practically fixed so when we use that we've got a value of 0.7 our effective length factor so we only use if we thought it was a 10 meter long beam it's actually only a 7 meter long beam in terms of design because the stiffness prevents the the buckling so but that's on the one side then we've got an other side here where it can rotate, and the same thing occurs here. And then this is now unrestrained in plan. Unrestrained in plan. So here, it's unrestrained, it can rotate. And that means the effective length of a simply supported beam is one. So we would take the effective length this side as one. So in terms of it, we've got one side which is practically fixed, the other side which is unrestrained, and then we're just going to take the average of those two because there are two boundary conditions. The same thing then comes now to this next section. It's just, it's the same both sides. So then our effective length becomes one, so it's a lot easier. Now we move on to the cantilever section. And remember with cantilever effective lengths, we have to look at both the tip and the support. Now at the tip, it's free. There's nothing preventing either rotation or lateral movement. Then at the support, here we've got, for the, the cantilever, it is continuous. So the beam continues on beyond it. This would, if this connection was here, it would be fixed, but here it is continuous, this part here. So it's continuous. Plus, it's also a question of can the whole section twist here about a longitudinal axis? Because we have a support top and bottom, the beam can't twist along its length. It is prevented from twisting, so it stays there. So it is continuous plus lateral plus torsional support. Torsional support. Now, from that, it's continuous with lateral and torsional support. If we look up in the cantilever table, we get an effective length of about two and a half. Now that tells us we thought this beam was one meter, but we actually converted into a two and a half meter, big, a two and a half meter long beam because it is so much more slender because of this buckling behavior. Whereas this one, it's three meters. We design it as three meters. This one is five, but we only, uh, we actually reduce the effective length because of the, the border supports that preventing buckling. It all comes back to buckling, influencing how easily or how difficult is it for it to buckle when the load is applied. So that's taken us through a simple example of a single beam, but with three different sections we would design, and then 
how to then go through getting the effective links. The rest of design is relatively straightforward. It's normally these sections where people make the most mistakes in terms of how does it buckle and what are my boundary conditions for design. Thank you.